God. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, the everlasting God, the everlasting God.
Amen. Be seated. That's a good song, right? We serve a Savior that reigns and that truly lives. Um, And I'm so excited to be here this morning telling you about this information. Uh, We believe at Trinity that saying that song, Our Savior Lives, doesn't just mean that you come here on Sunday morning. It means that you affect people throughout your lives. And we are so excited to be offering a program on Sunday nights to our kids here at Trinity. This program, Courageous Kids, is for kids ages three through sixth grade. And we're having this program because we don't just believe that Jesus lives. We don't just believe that he has great stories in the Bible, but we believe that because of that faith, we can step out courageously and affect people around us. Uh, Sunday nights from 5.30 to 7, starting next Sunday, January 11th, we have our Courageous Kids program. And if you have kids, um, you've probably been singing the song that I have, Mom and Dad can hardly wait for school to start again, right? My, I'm the only one, apparently. I'm so excited for school to start again. We at Trinity are so excited for Courageous Kids to start again because on Sunday nights, our kids come here and they don't just hear Bible stories. We do music, we do recreation, crafts, and we learn about missions. And this semester, this spring semester, we're gonna learn all about the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're asking our kids to step out courageously at school, some of them at preschool, and sharing about Christ and in sharing that through love and through the way the Good Samaritan heard about it, through our actions. And so if you have a kid that's age three through sixth grade, you can register them over the phone this week by calling the church office, or you can just come next Sunday night at five, around 515, we'll start registering kids for Courageous Kids. We would love to have you there. Now, if you don't have a child age three through sixth grade, but you're listening to me thinking that sounds awesome, because it is, we would love to have you here to help us with these kids. They need adults that are willing to step out and say, you know what, Christ is important enough for me to be here and share it with you. And so if you're one of those adults right now that's thinking, man, I could be a part of that, I have something to share, we would love for you to come next Sunday night around 5.15, and we will give you a spot to serve these kids. They need to hear from you, and they're excited about Christ, and that's something that can affect you as an adult as well. So right now, I think Clint is going to come. We're going to welcome each other, but we would love to have you next Sunday night at Courageous Kids. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It is a new year. Welcome. This morning we're meeting as uh, in one worship service. We met in one Bible study that presents special challenges for us. So I've been told to let you know that the expensive seats in the front are available. <laughs> and that if you could help us, if you have space on either side of you, y'all move to the middle. And that way that people who are coming in might have a seat that next to you. So, (laughs) all right. With this new year, starting next week, we'll begin a new Sunday morning schedule. We'll have three worship services, three opportunities to worship, and we'll have two Bible studies Now, that gives us three opportunities to worship and many more opportunities to connect and serve than we've had before. And we look forward to all the challenges that will bring to us. Uh, There's going to be, we'll be bumping into each other in the halls. We'll be trying to find our places. But know that you are invited next Sunday morning at 930 down in the gym We'll have a fellowship time where you will be able to to know where a good Bible study class is for you. They'll meet at 945 and 11 o'clock. So please take advantage of that. Come and be with us. Um, Inside your bulletins, you'll have a pullout. Guests, we want to want you to know that you are welcome this morning. If this is your first time with us, there is a bag in the back in the foyer that has a little blue paper on top, and that is a gift for you. And inside of that has information about Trinity and about what's going on here so that you would get to know a little bit more about us. If you would, please do um, register your attendance this morning so that we'll get to know you and know that you are here. Guests and members alike, there is also a section for prayer requests, and your staff will pray this week for each prayer request that comes in in the um, 
the offertory plate today. It is good to see you. Welcome. Anticipation is a good thing. Like Diane said, sometimes you anticipate the kids going home to, or going to, uh, to school. I had a, a friend that told me, he said, there's, there's one thing that grandparents look forward to more than their grandchildren coming to their house. It's seeing them go back home, <laughs> you know? Uh, we love our grandkids. You love your kids, but anticipation. The Bible talks about us anticipating that day when we get to sing all together in heaven. And I'm not ready to punch my ticket just yet unless the Lord decides that's the case, but I am ready to anticipate that with every breath. Let's stand together if you can and let's sing together when we all get to heaven.
we enter this new year that you've given us a new year. We've recently received new gifts, uh, new clothes, new toys, and so on. But Father, the greatest new that we have is the fact that we are new creations in you. And Father, I pray uh, at this time of year that we might be good news to those around us. Father, we ask you to bless this offering this morning. It's the easiest one we have to give. And yet I pray that in this week to come, starting even right now, that we would be, each one of us, a fragrant offering of life to those who are dying. Father, we ask you to inhabit this place. Let yourself be glorified through the word, through the singing, through the giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. But now I see Through many dangers, toils and snares I have already, already come This grace hath brought me safe thus far And grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as shining as the sun we've no less days to sing god's praise than when we first begun, first begun, when we first begun. Happy New Year. The word new has been used several times today already, and I'm reminded every time I hear that word, even as Wiley shared in his prayer, that those who are in Christ are new creations, we're new creatures. The old is gone, the new has come. And even hearing uh, Lynn sing Amazing Grace, we're so blessed today to know that Amazing Grace remains the same and has been there in the past, is there today, and will continue to be there in our future. I hope that you had a, a great time of Christmas celebration with your family and that you had an opportunity of seeing the year come in in a, in a grand way. Uh, when you came into the worship service this morning, you were given uh, a, a puzzle piece, a jigsaw puzzle piece. And many of you were asking, well, what is that for? And if you took one, I want you to take it out and put it in your hand just a second. We're going to look at it just a minute. Um, I heard that one of our ushers was saying it's about a part of the lottery. And several of you went back to get more pieces. But just one piece will do because it really identifies with our thought today that we're going to be looking at. When you think about a, a puzzle, uh, I think about a jigsaw puzzle. And you may be a puzzler. I, I'm not a, a big jigsaw puzzler. My wife is and, and her family. We uh, sometimes put a, t a puzzle together on a table and spend several days working on it like you might do. But, but uh, as you look at a jigsaw puzzle, you recognize that there are a lot of pieces that go into a big picture. Lots of pieces, sometimes 500, sometimes 1,000. I'm not sure if they make more than 1,000 piece puzzles. They do. I see you, some of you puzzlers out there know that there are more than 1,000 piece puzzles. Well, I want you to look at your puzzle piece this morning. I want you to identify with this thought. This thought is 
that we sometimes are like a puzzle piece. That, that we, you, our life, who we are, is like a puzzle piece. And, and here are the similarities that we have with the puzzle piece. Everyone is unique. Most puzzle pieces, there aren't two alike in a, in a, in a puzzle. There might be with different colors, but, but usually they're all unique. So when we think about who we are, every one of us are unique. Another thing that we think about is every piece and every person fits somewhere. There's not a discarded puzzle piece. There's not a discarded person. But we all fit somewhere. Also, we know that every piece of the puzzle is important to the big picture of the puzzle, that you won't get the big picture unless you put all the pieces together in the right way. And as you look at the colors on your puzzle piece, you might have some blue or some white or some different colors. As important as the colors are, the shapes around them are just as important because they connect you with somebody else. Within the world that we live in, we've been called to live a life before people. We live a life of Christ living in us among people. And we do that having been associated with the church. When we come to know Christ in our life, God places us within his church and we are put together with other people. And then the last piece is that we really don't, each puzzle piece unveils a beautiful picture that is not recognized by just simply looking at the puzzle piece, you probably can't determine what the puzzle looks like that you have that would be put together if we were to put all of our pieces together. If at the close of the service you'd like to come see, and I think maybe even at the end of the slideshow we have, you might see a picture, but there's a box up here that you can see what the beautiful picture would be like. But you are an important part of that. I also think about a puzzle piece thinking that it could also represent something like this. It represents a year of life. We think about the puzzles that we are, the think about the life that we've lived. Each year is like we add another puzzle piece to our picture of life. We get to add a picture this year, a piece this year in 2015 that wasn't there last year. We look at the piece we added last year in 2014 that wasn't there the year before. And even though we look back, we can't define who we are by looking back at the pieces that are already placed nor can we define who we are by looking forward to the pieces that are absent, that are void, but we look at the process, the process of being the puzzle being put together. And in that process, we think of life. We think of the opportunity of, of looking at life and what it brings to us. 2015 has the potential of bringing to us great things, just as 2014 did. 2014, for all of us, we would have some highs and some lows. We probably all would have those. 2015 would probably be no different. We'll have some highs and some lows. But the thing that sustains us through them all sometimes are the connecting pieces that we have whenever we come to realize we connect with other people. And when we connect with other people, we're able to be stronger together with them in our lives than we are by ourselves. Understanding that the greatest person in our life is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we think of the word new, looking at life and evaluating, looking at last year, looking at this year, we, we have an opportunity of, of trying to be better by evaluating where we've been and where we're going. We think the whole idea of resolutions, and, and every one of us or many of us have already been resolutions, and maybe you're still holding on to those for a few days, and maybe you'll hold on them for a long time. I, I, I'm blessed to hear that some of you last year took on the challenge of reading through the Bible as we were challenged as a church, and, and several of you toward the end of, of November and December wrote me an email and said, you know what, I'm going to be able to finish it in just a few weeks. So we had this whole idea of resolutions that we build, and we think we will be better if we can just do better. We'll be better if we can just do better. And, and we think it may be, well, maybe I'm going to read the Bible through this year, or maybe I'm going to do something new, or maybe I'm just going to do something that's going to help me be more healthy. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise more so that I'll have a better style of, life, of living and, and do what I can there. Well, looking around, there are always some things that we look at and ask ourselves, can we do something better? Is there something we can look at and evaluate? Well, in Scripture, Jesus does the same thing. Jesus takes opportunity from time to time to look around him and evaluate what he sees. And as he evaluates what he sees, he then makes a declaration. He makes a proclamation. He then gives a mission and also a plea. And this morning, we're going to be looking at that. When we think about all that Jesus has done, there are times in Scripture that Jesus looks around him and he makes a declaration on what he sees. And, and we look in, even in the book of Matthew, as Matthew writes his gospel, Matthew writes his gospel, and Matthew comes to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and we know those verse, those chapters to mean the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus preaches the greatest sermon ever preached. 
And, and many pastors and preachers have, have gone back to use the Sermon on the Mount to help lead the church because it's Jesus' words are preaching to the people because they needed to hear these words. After Matthew shares in his, in his narrative of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he goes on to 8 and 9. and 8 and 9, he talks about all the miracles that Jesus performed. Jesus heals a man of leprosy. He heals the centurion's servant. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He casts out demons. He calms a storm. He heals a paralytic. He heals a woman with an issue of blood. And he brings a dead girl back to life. Great preaching followed by all of these miracles that take place. And then this is what we hear the people say. The crowds respond by saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. And then we come to Matthew then chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. And that's our text this morning we're going to look at. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. All of these things have taken place. The teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, the preaching that took place, all of these miracles taking place, and then the people saying, we have never seen anything like this in Israel. And Jesus then shares these words. Matthew writes these words. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. As we look at that text, we, we understand that Jesus has already come and he's already shown his authority over sickness. He's shown his authority over death. He's shown his authority over nature to his disciples. And he's now beginning to put them in a perspective to where he's, to share, he's going to share with them the mission that he's fixing to put them on. If you read through in Matthew chapter 10, you see he's fixed to send his 12 out. He's fixed to send them out and have them continue to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. It says in the beginning that Jesus goes throughout all the towns and the villages. Jesus doesn't stay inside the big city. He didn't stay just in Jerusalem. But he went to all the towns and the villages. You see, Jesus wasn't just concerned about the people in the big towns. Jesus was concerned about everybody. He was concerned about all people. And as a result of being concerned about all people, he went everywhere and went anywhere. And it says that he preached and he taught and he did all that we're looking at. He, he goes to these places. Everybody has an access to Christ because Jesus gives validity to all places. It says that Jesus teaches in their synagogues. He, he went and he taught in their synagogues. He is seen in attendance at public worship. On the day that he's supposed to be with all the others in public worship, Jesus is present. Now, he's present there to be seen, but at the same time, he's also there present because there's going to come a time in their public worship when a teaching will be offered. And Jesus knows that he's going to take advantage of that to stand up and to teach in the synagogues. And not just in one, but in all the synagogues of the towns and the villages, of all the smaller places, as well as the big places as well. So Jesus is seen taught. He's teaching in the synagogues. It says he preaches the good news of the kingdom. He, Jesus lives missionally, not only in the synagogue is he teaching, but outside walking from place to place and, and town to town and speaking from people to people. He is living a missional life, living a life with God's mission in mind, preaching the kingdom of God. He takes advantage of the gathering of all the people to teach. He takes advantage of living missionally in front of the people as he preaches. In Luke, we read the words that the spirit of the Lord has come upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is good news. People would want to hear that. And Jesus is going around and he's preaching that missionally as he goes from place to place. It says also that Jesus heals every disease and sickness. Jesus makes people whole. What Jesus is doing while Jesus is on mission... While Jesus is on the mission of God that he's put him on, he makes an observation. He makes an observation. This observation, he observes the crowd. And the observation leads him to compassion. He has a compassion. When Jesus sees the crowd, he has compassion. He saw the crowds earlier in Matthew chapter 5, and what did he do? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside. He sat down, and he began to teach them the Sermon on the Mount. This is the crowds. The crowds just recently in chapter 9 have said, we have never seen anything like this in all of Israel. But yet when Jesus sees the crowds this time, what does he see? 
This same group of people that said, nothing like this has ever happened. We can't believe we're seeing all these things. This is the group that Jesus is looking at, and it leads him to have compassion. It leads him to have pity because what he sees, he knows they're in need. He has compassion upon them. When Jesus sees a crowd, he's moved. He, he is moved by love to pity because they're perishing. He says the crowds are like sheep without a shepherd. They're harassed. They're helpless. Compassion leads to uh, compassion increases due to Israel's lack of leadership. When he sees these people, these, these sheep that he is talking about, they don't have a shepherd. He's talking about Israel being in place of having leadership, but there's no shepherds around. No one is helping to lead the people. And he sees the sheep as being helpless and being harassed. Leadership in place, but, but no leading, or maybe poor leading. Maybe it's, it's idle shepherding, or maybe it's poor shepherding, or artificial shepherding, or whatever it is. They're not leading the people where they need to be. In fact, they're not feeding the flock. They're fleecing the flock. And they're not taking care of the sheep. They're taking what they can off of the sheep. They're putting burdens on the sheep. And as a result of all these things taking place, the sheep are scattered and they're harassed. I know that the Jubilee class this morning had a lesson on sheep and that you guys have already know all this before the rest was to catch up with you. Sheep that are harassed or helpless, the other uh, King James Version uses the word weary or scattered, gives the idea that these sheep are in distress. Uh, a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing for this, I called my, my sheep doctor, uh, Derwin Hill. Several others I could have called, I know, but called Doran and said, Doran, tell me, is this true? Tell me about sheep. And, and so he shared with me that sheep do better in a flock than they do by themselves. And when we think about a sheep in distress, we think about sheep that are in distress, first of all, they're exposed. They're unable to find their way home. They're vulnerable. They're helpless. They, they don't know what to do. And they make themselves available to predators. Predators that would come, the wolves and the coyotes, because they're by themselves. They, they are easy targets to be picked off. And they need each other in numbers. If they stay together and they stay in the light, then they will stay away from the predators, the coyotes, because there's safety in numbers. So when Jesus sees these sheep, he says they're distressed, they're, they're harassed, they're helpless, they're weary, they're scattered, they're by themselves, they're not where they need to be because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And when we think today, we think about how would we relate that to where we are today, we would say this, that sinful souls are like lost sheep. They need shepherds to bring them back in. Separated, the sheep are in danger, but together the sheep can be in safety. Then the word comes. Then, Jesus says, he looks to his disciples and he shares this compassion that he's filled, he's filled with leads him to a mission. The mission he is fixing to share with them out of his heart of compassion. The mission that he's fixing to place his disciples in and put them on. He says, the harvest is plentiful. That's an encouraging word. The harvest is plentiful. It's not that there's not a drought. It's not that there's nobody there to go serve. There's nobody there to go pull into the kingdom. There's, the harvest is plentiful. That's the encouraging word. That's the good news. But the discouraging word, the, the defeating word, is that the laborers are few. There are laborers in the field. There's some doing hard work, but they can't do it by themselves. They need somebody to help them. They need someone to come and help them pull in the harvest that is so plentiful. So the mission is, look at the harvest. It's plentiful. It's ready to be brought in, but the workers to go out and work in it are little. They're few. We need more people. More people need to be called to go and do the work. And so what does Jesus ask his uh, disciples to do? The mission that he's called them on leads him to pray. To pray. Not, not to go sign up. Sign up and go, go out to the field and go do the work. No. The work that we're called to do is to pray, to pray. To pray for what? To pray specifically, to pray specifically for what? To pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into the field. For the Lord will send out the workers into the field. Who owns the harvest? It's the Lord. Who has done all the work preparing the harvest to be brought in? It, it's the Lord. But who is he going to send out to do it? It's going to be us. It's going to be others who hear the word of the Lord to go and serve and to go and work and to go and pull and to go and harvest. And as we go and harvest, the harvest that is plentiful is ready to come in because there are people ready to respond to the gospel. There are people ready to be persuaded to trust in God. But the workers are limited. The workers are few. And so Jesus' words to his apostles are, pray, pray, pray. 
You know, it, it is a blessed thing to see a people in love with God's Word, but it's even better and more blessed to see people who are in love with God's Word, who are obedient to it and willing to share it. It's one thing to love the Word so much that we want all the knowledge we can get out of it, we want to be able to put it in our life, but we want to do it so we can obey it and live it and let people see it in us as we share it with other people. You know, we're never called to do something that we're not concerned about. We're never called to be anything that we're not concerned about. And we're not really concerned about something unless we find ourselves praying for it. You know, when I think about Kerrville, Texas, Kerrville, Texas is, a, is an incredible place to live. There is a, there's a, a witness of Jesus Christ here that's not like in other towns. It's a special witness. But it's not the greatest witness it can be because as we look around, there's still people who need to be brought in. There's still people who, different ages, older, middle, younger, whatever their age may be, that need to find that there's a relationship that they can have with Christ. And, and there are people who are scattered by themselves, and being scattered and by themselves, they're easy targets for predators and for the wolves to come, for the enemy to come and take them down. So as we look at the field, our responsibility is to pray, to pray. Pray that God will send people out into his field. And as we pray, and it becomes our burden, our passion, we might just find that he wants to use us to be part of that. You know, it's our responsibility to pray, and it's God's privilege and his part in putting people in place. It's interesting to me that in Jesus' last conversation that's been written with Peter, what did he ask Peter and what did he tell Peter? Do you remember it's recorded in John chapter 21? He went to Peter after Peter had denied him and he'd seen the resurrected Christ and they'd spent some time together and, and they'd had a couple of opportunities of spending time and they're on the beach and, and Jesus just turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you really love me more than anybody else? And Peter says, you know I do, Lord. And what does he tell him? He says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. He told him a second time, Peter, do you really love me? If you do, then, then take care of my lambs. And then he said, if you really love me, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. It's a responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus Christ to feed sheep. It's my responsibility, as, as Paul wrote to, to Timothy as a pastor, to, to make sure that we feed the flock that gathers here on Sunday, uh, that we call ourselves Trinity Baptist Church. And in 2 Timothy 4, 2, what did Paul tell Timothy but this? Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Every day is a new day in the life of Trinity Baptist Church. But next week is a new way for us to gather. It's a new way for us to gather because we're going to be gathering at three different times and having two different options of Bible study. And as we do so, we do so because we feel that the Lord has led us in this way. I want you to take your puzzle piece out again and look at it one more time. As a staff, we've spent time trying to figure out how we can move our church into the direction that we sense that the Lord is moving us into. And, and this is not something that, that we have taken lightly, but we've been in prayer about, that we've been asking the Lord to direct us, we've been walking with you, you've been walking with us, we've been making preparations and plans, and next week we feel like that this is the kickoff that we have, that as we've talked about, new doors are opening for Trinity Baptist Church. New doors are not opening for the 830 worship service. New doors are not opening for a 945 worship service. New doors are not opening for an 11 o'clock worship service. New doors are opening for Trinity Baptist Church. It's not one against the other. It's not us against them. And as much as we see this jigsaw puzzle piece, it's not an 830 and a 945 and an 11 o'clock service that comes together. No, this is one church coming together at three different times because we feel like that we need to do our part to tell as many as we can about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The music's going to be different in some of the services. But it's not a us and them. It's a us. It's who we are. It's what we've been called to do. We want to allow everyone to have their own expression of worship and to come in with the heartfelt of worship. As we think about even, one of, Larry, you sang one of my favorite songs, When We All Get to Heaven Today. And, and as I think about it, when we all get to heaven, I don't think any of us are going to get in there and go, oh, 
that's the wrong song. (laughs) Because you see, it's not about the song. It's about who we're singing to when we get to heaven. And next week, it's not about the music. It's about who we're singing to. And it's not about the preaching. It's about where it's coming from. And as we come together as a, as a church, my prayer is that we will recognize that as Romans 12, 4 and 5 says to us, just as each one of us has, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Guess what? The 11 o'clock service belongs to the 945 service. Those people, that's us. Hey, y'all, that's us. We're not doing something different, totally separate from what God has called us to do. We are together in this, and we need to move forward. Because if we don't move forward in this, we're no better than sheep that are scattered and weary and harassed and helpless. And if we move forward in that direction, the enemy's going to pick us off. There's a call today, and we've been asking several of you to pray for this new schedule. For 21 days, you've been getting it. If you're a member of our church, we have your email address. We've been sending it to you to pray with us so we can pray for the same thing as we're moving forward. And we try to think about all the needs that we have. And I'm sure we've missed some. But we tried to cover the base because we want to move forward having covered this with God in prayer. And we feel like that we can do that as a people of his. The people that come to this location on Sunday at Trinity Baptist Church, the people that come back on a a, a Tuesday morning or a Wednesday morning and a Thursday night or a Thursday morning or whatever time we come, the people who come together at this place and we identify ourselves as Trinity Baptist Church. May we not be a people that identify ourselves as I'm the 830 crowd or I'm the 945 crowd or I'm the 11 o'clock crowd, but may we identify ourselves as the people of God who have come together at Trinity Baptist Church. And we have three different expressions of worship. And you can come to whichever one you want to come to and grow in Christ. And let's be together. Let's go the same direction. You see, it's not about the music. It's about who we sing to. Sheep that get scattered are easy targets. And we don't want to be that. We want to be effective Scattered, the enemy can come and take us away. But together, we can show that God is mighty, mighty, mighty among us. I do have a little time, and I think probably the picture is there. Can we show the picture of what the puzzle would look like if we... There's the picture of the puzzle that would look like if we all put our puzzle pieces together in the right way, in the right order. It's, it's simply, it's, it's entitled, there's a title to it, and it's entitled, Under His Wing. And we want to do that because your puzzle piece fits with somebody else. Because we're a part of the same body of Christ right here that gathers at Trinity Baptist Church. And I'm excited about an 8.30 worship. I'm excited about a 9.45 worship. I'm excited about 11 o'clock worship. I'm excited that we might have the opportunity of reaching people and, and how blessed we are today to not have a whole lot of vacancies. But next week when we go from one service to three services, there could be a lot of blank seats and again, what's our role? Our role is to pray that the Lord would help us to fill them. Because there are people here in Kerrville, Texas, that need to hear about Jesus. There are Christians here in Kerrville, Texas, that need to find a body of faith that they can connect to, that they can be a puzzle piece with, and that together we can see God doing mighty things in our community, and through our community do mighty things in the world. This morning as, we, as we've gathered and as we've come together to worship and sing songs and to listen to a challenge of where we're going and what we're going to do, we don't move anywhere without Christ in us. And, and today it's possible. It's possible that you've come and you've listened and, and you recognize that you may not be one of those disciples with Jesus. You may be one of those sheep that are scattered. And today I just want to share with you that God's desire for you, he has done everything for you. The greatest new thing in your life can happen this day when you come to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And in so doing, move with us as we move forward together in unity for the sake of the kingdom and for God's glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. How blessed we are that 
we read about the sheep and how scattered they were when Jesus saw them. And Jesus' desire wasn't to go and get out, grab them all up and pull them together, but to recognize that he was going to be here for a limited time and he was going to need people to do that work and to have that mission. And so the, the response was to pray, to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send that workers into his field. Lord, this morning, it's our prayer. There's, if there's a sheep here, if there's a person here that does not know you, today they will come forward and allow us to share with them how they can make Jesus the Lord of their life. And for the rest of us that are here, may we recognize that we need to be together. And that we need to move forward in unity and allow your Holy Spirit to work in this church. Not as a young church in an old church or a median church or a praise song church or a guitar church or a drum church or an organ church. or what, But as your church, as the church that moves forward for the kingdom of God. Because only in Christ can we make a difference where we live and where we're going. Bless us as we respond today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. I know that uh, as we begin a new work, I, I was thinking, you know, the pastor's preaching about a new thing, and Wiley mentioned that. Uh, that's, not a, that's not something just for today. Isaiah 43 has something very much to say about that same thing. One of the things that's going to be different, and I just want you to understand this now, is that um, our, our traffic patterns will be a little bit different than what we've had before. And in particular, if your pattern is that you're used to coming and getting your place here in the worship center around 1030 or thereabouts, getting ready for the 11 o'clock worship, you're going to find some folks in here doing something that they've not been doing before. So uh, my encouragement is uh, 
as we approach this, the end of the 8.30 time frame, if you're going to be a part of the 9.45 service, just realize that at the end of the worship time, that's when the Lord is speaking to folks, make decisions, pastors rounding up what he's saying in, in the sermon time. So as you gather in the foyer or uh, that type of thing, just be mindful of that. That's a great time. If you encounter a time the doors are closed and the worship service is still going on, pray for what God's doing inside this room. It's a great time to do that because you're not going to have anything else to do but gripe. So you might as well just use it, use that very constructively, you know. And so just know that uh, we're going to have to figure this thing out. And there's going to take, it's going to be a dance that we're going to have to figure out for a few weeks till we know where we can go and when the doors are going to open and who's going to be coming out while we're coming in and all of that. I wish I could tell you, but I can't. You know, I am very comforted by knowing how we're coming and going. You've seen the choir come and go. You know, that's my nature. But I can't tell you that exactly yet. But I know that God's going to work those details out. And the thing is, you know, if, if we're a little unsettled, sometimes that's when God does his, most of his talking to us. When we're comfortable and we feel like we know what everything is supposed to be and where everything is, Sometimes that makes us uh, to where God can't talk to us quite as much. So just be open to what he's got to do. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm with you, Pastor. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do next week. We circle a couple of things on your calendar, if you will. One of them's, uh, well, I don't think either one of these are in your bulletin. January the 25th in the evening is going to be our next family gathering time. It's not just a business meeting. It's family gathering time. And I, since the worship ministry gets to direct this, I get to kind of say what we're going to do, which is nice. And I think we ought to have our second annual chili cook-off for that. Last year we had, we had tables. I don't know what we have, somewhere around 75 feet of table filled with chili. And, uh, man, it's a great time. So get your recipes out. I think we're going to have different categories and all that kind of stuff. But we'll declare some winners. And, and everybody who comes and takes part is a winner. We'll do some musical things. We may have the world's largest game of musical chairs. Who knows what's going to happen that night. But plan to come on January 25th. On February the 21st, we've got a unique opportunity. Uh, Debbie Williams has been gifted by God to teach in the area of prayer and God laid it on her heart a few years ago to, to do this conference called Pray With Passion uh, across the United States in every state. She's made it to many of those states. She's going to be doing it right here at our church on, on Saturday morning, February the 21st from 9 to noon. Uh, there's going to be some minor cost, and that uh, will be involved, but there's a book that you'll have. This is going to be a great time to come and learn about being a more effective prayer as, as God asks you uh, to be somebody who intercedes for others and who prays about those needs that come to light. But plan to be here on February the 21st. It's going to be videoed and streamed. So uh, we already have contacts of places that are going to be streaming it worldwide, not just close. So plan to be a part of that. I think it'll be a great time with us. Is there anything else I need to say? I've already said way too much, haven't I? All right. We're going to do something a little different than what we have done in the past. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and hold hands, but I am going to ask you to stand up and sing with us. Uh, we're going to sing a text that comes directly from Psalm 136, and uh, it's called Forever. And we're going to combine our 8.30 and 11 o'clock musician groups, and uh, as we sing together, uh, join us and wholeheartedly lift your voices this morning forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love 